Yankees at the guy's heart. He beats us to it. He, 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 I'm on the side, and I'm trying to get a word, and not, before I could even sit down, he's already handing out class, he's already sharing the gospel. And I, I'm like, man, slow down, you're making me look bad. <laughs> but he's at the guy's heart, man. I'm telling you, that man right there, he's going he's gonna to slay a lot of giants. Yeah, slow on. I speak it over your life, my brother. And I'm, I'm looking forward to slaying some giants with you. So, you know, when he told me what he was going to talk about, he was telling me, he's like, you know, God gave me a word about, you know, you know exterminating and cleaning the house, and, and I was smiling, and, I, and as he was done, I said, I said, no, I want to tell you why I'm smiling. He said, why? I said, the title of the message today is Clean House. <laughs> so you, you got all excited, because any time the whole is moving, you got to get excited, right? Yeah, and yes. So... And, you know, next week starts spring season, March 20th, next Saturday, start of spring. So I looked at the definition of spring cleaning, and it's a thorough cleaning of a house or a room, typically undertaken in spring. It's a, a thorough cleaning. Then I looked at the origins of, of the spring cleaning. Where did it come from? How did it start? And this is what I got, and it shocked me. Some researchers trace the origin of spring cleaning to the ancient Jewish practice that is thoroughly cleaning the home in anticipation of the springtime memorial feast of Passover. In remembrance of the Israelites' hasty flight from Egypt following their captivity there, during the seven-day observance of the Day of Unleavened Bread, which immediately followed the Passover, there were strict prohibitions against eating or drinking anything which may have been leavened or fermented with yeast. Jews are not only supposed to re refrain from leavened foods, they are expressly commanded to rid their homes of even small rem remnants of leaven for the length of the holiday. Therefore, observant Jews conducted a thorough spring cleaning of the house, followed by a traditional hunt for yeast crumbs by candlelight on the evening before the holiday began. The Feast of Unleavened Bread started, I want to explain this to you all, after Moses had went, God told Moses to go to Egypt and, and free the Israelites of bondage. They were in bondage there. And God said, sending plague after plague, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And um, eventually Pharaoh decided, just let go, just get him out of here. I had enough of all these plagues, just get him out of here. And God told the, the Israelites, he told Moses to tell the Israelites, he said, tell them, you don't have time to make food with yeast. You don't have time to make, bake the bread with the yeast. Take the bread you have. It's time to go get out now. And in the Bible, yeast is symbolic of sin. And see what God was, was representing there. He was telling him, look, you're free to go, and while you got a chance, go. Because Pharaoh's going to change his mind. And Pharaoh's going to come, and if you're still here, you're going to get killed. And see, that's symbolic of us. See, while we have a chance to go, God, God's saying go. He's saying, you know, get all of the yeast out of your life. It's time to go. See, he wanted them to leave as fast as he can because he, God wants them, wanted them out of bondage. God didn't want his people in bondage. See, sin is bondage. The Bible says whoever sins is a slave to sin. God wants us out of that. He don't want his people in bondage. He wants his people free. And God was telling them, remove the yeast from your house. And see, God's saying that today. It's time to remove the yeast from your house. It's time to clean house. Pastor Carl preached a message last week called God Lives Here. And he was talking about how God doesn't dwell in, in temples built by hands, but he dwells in his people now. Now, if God dwell, dwells inside of us, and we are the house of God, don't you think the house ought to be clean? Right. I mean, if God was coming to my home, I would clean it up for him. But the Bible says God dwells here. He lives inside of us. So what kind of, of dwelling place are you providing for God? I want to look at a man who took the removal of sin serious. And I, I think Deborah's going to be excited when I say this name. That man's name is Jehu. <laughs> Jehu was a commanding officer in Israel's army between 842 and 814 B.C. And God wanted him to completely remove the, 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 the family of Ahab. See, Ahab was the king of Israel. And Ahab married Jezebel. Jezebel came from a from an area where they worship false gods and they, they would do all kind of rituals and they practice witchcraft. So when he married Jezebel, he was a 
very passive man. Instead of him saying, no, I don't allow it here, he allowed that to overtake him, and he became one of the most wicked kings, the Bible says. Jezebel brought in idolatry and witchcraft into the nation of Israel. Now, by this time, the story we're going to read, by this time, Ahab was killed. He was killed in battle. But God wanted his bloodline destroyed, and he wanted Je Jezebel removed. Because she was bringing wickedness and sin into the land, and all of his, all of his, um, all of his people, all of his sons, all of his cousins, they were all like him. God said, "Wipe them out. Don't leave nothing left. Just like the knees. Don't leave them in the crumbs. Get them out of the land because they're bringing, they're bringing witchcraft into the land, and they're bringing idolatry into the land. And Israel is God's land, just like we're God's people. He wanted it out. He wanted it gone. He was telling Jacob to clean house." Now let's read the story. Get a sip of water. Let's get going. Second Kings nine, verse one through seven. The prophet Elijah summoned a man from the company of the prophets and said to him, "Tuck your cloak into your belt. Take this flask of olive oil with you and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you get there, look for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi." Go to him, get him away from his companions, and take him into an inner room. Then take the flask and pour the oil on his head and declare, This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king of Israel, and open the door and run. Don't delay. So the young prophet went to Ramah Gilead. When he arrived, he found the army officers sitting together. I have a message for you, commander, he said. For which of us, asked Jehu, for you, commander. Jehu, Jehu got up and went into the house. Then the prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anoint you king over the Lord's people Israel. You are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master. And I will avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. So the first thing we see is, is that Jehu was anointed. Now the anointing, the pouring on of the oil represents the Holy Spirit. It's funny because when my mom, when we got saved, my mom got saved first, and we thought we were saved, but I was still dabbling in the world. My mom had a lot of zeal, but not a lot of knowledge. And uh, she she took the oil thing. So I guess she writes about the oil, and she took it to extremes. <laughs> I was, I was living in sin, and I would come home, and, and I, I, I got surprised. I had oil. <laughs> I had oil on my doorknob in my bedroom. When I opened it up, I had, she put oil on my, on my air conditioner and the power button. Then when I touched the power button, oil would get on my hand. She had oil on my headboard. She had crosses on the headboard with oil. She had oil on my remote control. She had oil on, she had oil on the floor. When I opened the door, I slid in. <laughs> I felt like Kramer. She wanted me. To, she wanted the Holy Spirit to be in me, but she didn't realize the olive oil had no power. There was no power in olive oil. There was, there was power in the Holy Ghost. So it was funny. She's she's the one of them that she's too saved, you know. She's out there praying for the trees. She, my dad. It's funny because my dad makes me laugh. Well, she had the uh, the washing machine broke, and she was praying for it. He said, "You're praying for everything." The funny thing was, it started working again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she prays she pray for everybody. But I want to look at what the anointing does. There's three things the anointing does. The first thing is the anointing sanctifies. Leviticus 8.12 And he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to what? To sanctify him. You notice how when the prophet got to Jehu, the first thing he did was he got him away from his companions. See, one of the, one of the things God wants to do in our life is to, is to pull us out, is to get us away. One of the things God wants to clean out of our life is some of our friends. When I got saved, I'm telling you, I had friends for 20-something years. They just went. They just went. I was, I was sanctified. God had separated me. He pulled me away from them. That's good. He started separating me, separating me from people and things of the world, even family members. Why? Because they were hindering me. And they were causing me to stumble and they were enticing me to sin. 
You see, I could hear people saying, but that's my friend. But I, I love that person. But that's, that's my boy. I can't, I can't, I don't want to be separated from them. But see, the thing is, is that sometimes people are more worried. I don't want to say this. They're more worried about being separated from their friends, but they're not worried about that their friends are calling them to be separated from God. Come on, brother. Uh, come on. Woo. I came to a point where I prayed and told God, God, anybody's in my life that you don't want to take them out. I give it to you. I had friends that I was trying to, I was trying to be a light to them, and I was trying to witness to them. And as much as I was trying to, to pull them to God, the Spirit of me wanted them to have the things of God. The Spirit of them wanted me back in the world. And I'm not saying it was on purpose. I'm not saying they woke up and said, I want, I want to bring him down. No, it's the Spirit of that man that does it. I had, I had friends one night wanted me to be, well, I had a friend wanted me to be his best man. And I said, okay, he can't harm me. So why not I go into a bar? And I said, well, I don't, I'm not going to drink. I'm just going to go. And then before you know I'm on Bourbon Street, and before you know I'm in a strip club, and then before you know I'm at home, nobody else around me, and, I, and I'm separated from God. And I'm crying myself to sleep. Because the friends that I, that I loved caused me to be separated from God. And I told God then, and I said, God, anybody want me to take them out? Because I don't ever want to feel this pain again. Because I'm telling you, if you're born again, and you have the Spirit of God in you, and you start sinning, I'm telling you, you're going to feel a separation. Because the Bible says that it's, it's your sins that separate you from God. It's your sins that do it. And I'm telling you, it's a pain. You feel like you lost a part of yourself. Because now you've got a Spirit that's alive in you, and when you start doing it, you feel like that Spirit man is dying. I don't want that anymore. I said, God, you got to take this from me. I don't, I don't want to ever feel separate from you. You see, sometimes we have to come out in order to help those very people. Let me explain. You know, we went to a, me and Antoine went to a, a facility where they had people on drugs. And some of y'all know the story, but some of y'all may not. But a man had overdosed right in front of us. And me and Antoine laid hands on a man for 15 minutes praying. And 15 minutes in, after the man had been dead, no pulse, no oxygen, nothing, the man had come back to life. Now, if I had been in that same situation, if I had been one of his friends, if I had been on drugs like him, could I have done that? <laughs> no. But you see, it's because that we came out of the darkness. It's because me and Antoine, we were out of the darkness, we can go into darkness now and bring light and bring life. But I couldn't do that before. And see, there's people in our lives that we need to be impacting, but we can't impact them as long as we're among them. We have to come out from among them. That's good. I'm not saying completely cut them off. I'm saying, look, you need to separate yourself from the world so that the light can shine on you so you can go back into the world and you can be a light. But you can't because you're in the same darkness they're in. I heard this. I was at an abortion clinic one time, and Rusty Thomas said this, and it just... It hit me to my core. He was looking at the, at the abortion clinic and he was talking to the church on this side. And he said, you see that, that clinic right there? He said, that's darkness. He said, and that, that's wickedness. And I understand. He said, but before you can ever beat that darkness out there, you have to beat the darkness in here. Mm -hmm. I love it. How can we ever expect to, over, to beat the darkness out there when we're still dealing with darkness inside? Mm -hmm. How can I ever go try to tell somebody that you need to get free when I'm still in bondage myself. Yeah. How can I tell somebody about how good it is to be in Christ that there's freedom in Christ when I still have shackles on my legs? Preach, Come on, Jesus. <laughs> the second thing the anointed does is the anointing teaches. John 14, 26. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. You see, before Jehu was anointed, Jehu didn't realize how bad the land was. Jehu didn't realize how much wickedness was going on. He didn't realize how much sin was going on. He didn't realize how bad things were. But when the anointing hit him, it opened his eyes and he was able to see it for what it was and he was like, whoa, this is some bad stuff going on here. And see, when the anointing hits our life, it does the same thing. See, I didn't realize how bad I was before. I didn't realize how bad the world was. But when the anointing hit me, when the Holy Spirit comes upon me, I'm able to say, man, this world's in bad shape. And I look back on the things I was doing, and I say, man, I can't believe I was doing those things. Because the anointing has taught me. It taught me the things of God. It teaches me right from wrong. 
See, there are things that are not listed in the Bible that are wrong. But now that you have the Holy Spirit, you don't have to see them in the Bible when they're wrong. See, if you look, snorting cocaine is not in the Bible. Shooting up heroin is not in the Bible. Drinking whiskey, Jack Daniels, not in the Bible. But it doesn't have to be, because once you have the Holy Spirit, and you, you know they're wrong. Come on. I think put something all wrong. That's not in the Bible. Well, if you have the same Holy Spirit I have, you would know it's wrong. I think sometimes God, God figures he gave you a, a conscience and, and, and a brain. You don't, you don't have to put everything in there, you know? <clears throat> See, people say, I don't have any conviction now. See, I'll tell somebody, you, you, you know, you really need to cut it out of your life. And I'll say, well, it's not in the Bible. I don't have any conviction about it. I say, there's only two reasons for that. Either one, they don't have the Holy Spirit they claim they have. Or two, there are more in the conviction. See, the problem with that is, is the more you ignore the conviction, the harder your heart gets. And eventually, you don't hear it at all. And, and the harder your heart gets, the harder it's going to be for you to remove that sin out of your life. Third thing the anointing does, the anointing empowers. See, the anointing, the Holy Spirit empowered Jehu to go remove the sin out of the land. He was empowered now by God. <clears throat> Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Power. Say that when you say power. 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 You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. See, we can't expect the world to stop sinning. They're powerless over sin. Mm -hmm. they're, they're helpless. They're hopeless without that. They can't do it. If you could overcome sin on your own, you wouldn't need the Holy Ghost. See, Jesus died to forgive our sins. He sent the Holy Spirit so that we can have power over sin. You see, now we have no excuse for sin in our lives. Now that we have the Holy Spirit, we don't have, excuse, we don't have no excuse that those sin remains in our lives. So if there is still sin remaining in a Christian's life, it's not that it can't leave. It's that you simply don't want it to leave. Because right. you have the power to make it leave now. You have no excuse. So now that Jehu was anointing, anointed, <laughs> As we read verse 17, 17 through 22, we're going to see that Jehu was driven. 2 Kings chapter 9, 17 through 22. When the lookout standing on the tower in Jezreel saw Jehu's troop approaching, he called out, I see some troops coming, and get a horseman, and draw him ordered. Send him to meet them and ask, Do you come in peace? The horseman rode off to meet Jehu and said, This is what the king says. Do you come in peace? What do you have to do with peace, Jay replied, following behind me. The lookout reported the messengers, the messenger has reached him, but he isn't coming back. So the king sent out a second horseman. When he came to him, he said, This is what the king says. Do you come in peace? Jay replied, What do you have to do with peace? Following behind me. The lookout reported he has reached him, but he isn't coming back either. The driving is like that of Jehu, son of Nimshi. He drives like a maniac. Hitch up my chariot, Joram ordered. And when it was hitched up, Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, rode out, each in his own chariot, to meet Jehu. They met him at the plot of ground that had belonged to Naboth, the Jezreelite. When Joram saw Jehu, he asked, Have you come in peace, Jehu? How can there be peace? Jehu replied as long as all the idolatry and the witchcraft of your mother Jezebel abound. You see, Jehu wasted no time. The, the day he got orders from God to go and remove the sin out of the land, to go and remove all that stuff, he did it that day. He got his game plan together, he got his army, and he went at it that day. He was driven. He was driven. One, of the, one version says, instead of like a maniac, version says he drives like a madman. I like that. I like that he drives like a madman. He wasn't reckless because he got to what he did, what he had to do, but he was driving like a madman, full speed. You know, it's amazing. You're out there in the world, and you see people driving around. They're going 80 miles an hour. I could hear my dad saying that. He's speeding to go to a red light. And that's what they're doing. They're going nowhere fast. But when it comes to things of God, people are neutral. 
They have no drive. When it comes to removing a sound of their life, they just they, they pity patty around. They're not driven. <coughs> you notice how he didn't let, allow anybody to slow him down. People kept coming to him to kind of slow him down. But see, if he would have slowed down, if he would have talked to them and talked to them for a little while, eventually the lookout could have said, maybe this is war. Maybe we ought to, we ought to get prepared. See, maybe we ought to, we ought to go, you know, get our army together and get ready for this. But he didn't allow that. You see, because just like sin, if you don't, I don't want to say this. If you don't cut the sin out of your life, if you don't cut the sin out of your life, it'll eventually get stronger. It'll eventually get stronger. It'll eventually overtake you. You see, let's say, let's say you just got a little lust. Let's say at work you're just lusting over this girl and that girl, right? But see, if you don't take a stronger person, that lust will get stronger, and that lust will turn into action. Right. And then that action turns into adultery. And then that adultery turns into divorce. And that divorce has overtaken you. See, sin will only get stronger in your life. You, got, you, can't, you can't play around with it. You have to have the same approach David had, which was, get behind me. Hmm. Get behind me. I'm not letting anything slow me down from the things of God. Right. Get behind me. Amen. You see, there are only two kingdoms in this world. Only two. It's the kingdom of God and it's the kingdom of Satan. It's only two. And there's a dividing line. If I put stuff on this table, if I put a wedding ring and I put a, a bottle of alcohol and I put a Bible and I put uh, pictures of your kids, you can easily divide. Okay, these are of God and these are not. It's very easy to divide the things of God and the things of Satan. They're, they're worlds apart. And see, the things of Satan don't bring peace. <laughs> see, that's what Jehu was telling him. See, I know what kingdom you're coming from. Right. I know what's in that kingdom. What do you have to do with peace? And see, the things of Satan, they don't offer you peace. See, I can tell that's not of God. And I know that's not going to bring me peace. It might promise me peace, but in the end, it's only going to end up enslaving me. Right. <clears throat> Satan wants to slow you down with that. And our response has to be, get behind me. <coughs> so why should we be driven to remove the sin out of our life? I mean, why shouldn't we take like more of a, a lackadaisical approach? Why shouldn't we just be like, I'll deal with that next week? Or I'll, I'll wait. I, I know, I know that's, that's, but it's very small. I'll just deal with that next week. You see, Jehu knew why. He told him. He said, there will be no peace as long as that abounds. Hmm. See, there will be no peace. As long as it's sin in our lives, there will be no peace. See, that's what Jacob was telling him. You got to go. Because this, this land, this land is a peaceful land. See, the same thing goes with your spirit, the same thing goes with your spiritual house and also your physical house, your homes at home. There's not gonna be any peace in your house. Not as long as there's this cursing coming out of your mouths, not as long as there's cursing coming out of the TV. Not as long as cursing come out of the radio. There's not going to be any peace. People make fun of me. I'll watch PG movies. I don't allow it in my home. It's not, it's not coming in my house. I don't get the devil for the Not here. You see, you got, they got porn in the house, fornication, liquor. There's not going to be any peace as long as it's going on. There will be no peace as long as that abounds. <laughs> God can't bless sin. He won't bless it. Don't tell me, don't tell me you have a girlfriend and you're sleeping together and God is just blessing y'all. I'm telling you now because God will not bless sin. I don't care how you look at it. It's not going to happen. That's right. See, if you want your marriage, your home, and your kids blessed, you got to get the sin out. got to remove the sin. So we see Jehu was anointed. And now Jehu is driven. And in verse 30 through 33, we're going to see that Jehu was on God's side. Put it up. 2 Kings 9, 30 through 33. When Jehu went to Jezreel, when Jezebel heard about it, she put on eye makeup, arranged her hair, and looked out of a window. As Jehu entered the gate, she asked, Have you come in peace, you Zimri, you murderer of your master? He looked up at the window and called out, Who is on my side? Who? 
Two or three eunuchs looked down at him. Throw her down, James said. So they threw her down. And some of her blood splattered the wall and the horses as they trampled her underfoot. See, Jezebel put makeup on. She knew he was coming. She put makeup on and she fixed her hair. And that's what sin does. You see, sin tries to make itself look all nice and pretty. But see, Jezebel was a murderer. Jezebel was the killer. And that's how many sins, the sin that we're dealing with right now, maybe, that same sin has caused somebody we love maybe to go to hell. That same sin has caused somebody else to go to prison. That same sin. It tries to make itself look all nice and pretty to us. It tries to doll itself up. See, the spirit of Jezebel is still alive today. That spirit tries to, to seduce and deceive us. It looks for pushovers, those who are passive, like King Ahab. But see, if you're ever going to overcome sexual sin, if you're ever going to overcome lust, adultery, fornication, you can't have a spirit of Ahab. You've got to have a spirit of Jehu. I know I've dealt with it. At one time, I, I had the spirit of Ahab on me. And I got called out. I said, you need the spirit of Jehu. You're going to need the spirit of Jehu. If you're going to overcome what you're battling right now, you're going to need the spirit of Jehu. And I took it to, I took it to all. And praise be to God, I did. See, Jehu shouts out, who's on my side? Who? You notice the eunuchs didn't say, we are? No, they didn't say anything. You know what they did? They showed, they proved they were on his side. Their actions proved they were on Jehu's side. They didn't have to say, we are. No. <laughs> and you see, there's people in church, they, they, they say, I'm a Christian, and I'm on God's side, but their actions prove otherwise. God's not looking for talkers. God's looking for those who are proving it. Okay. I want to quote Abraham Lincoln here. He said, Sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side. For God is always right. Abraham Lincoln said, my greatest concern, my greatest concern is to be on God's side. Be on God's side. You know, when, when, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, when he came down, they, all, they were all involved in you know, uh, idol worship. And you know, it's the same thing. Moses came down and he said, who's on the Lord's side? Who? And they can't separate See, God, I can hear God saying that right now. Who's on my side? Who? See, God doesn't want us to say it. God doesn't want us to raise our hands and, and, and show. God wants you to prove it. God's saying, who's on my side today? Who, is, who has the anointing on them? Who is driven? Who's on my side? I'm saying today as a church, we take a stand and we show God we're on his side. I'm going to open up the altar and I want everybody to come up. And I want everybody, if there's any sin in your life, I want you to treat it like, like the yeast. And I want you to throw it down at the altar. Throw your sin down and show God you're on his side. See, you can't, you can't raise your hand and tell me you're on his side. I don't need to know. God knows. But I'm telling you now, if you don't throw your sin down, the Bible says your sin will find you out it will find you out. God is not a man and he should lie. If his word says that's the truth, your sin will find you out. You need to take a serious approach to this. We need to be a light to the world, and we can't be a light as long as we're dealing with darkness. It's time to get rid of it. Throw it down. And some people are going to say, well, I don't have any sin in my life. I'm good. You notice in the beginning how I was talking about how they would search the house with candlelight to find the crumbs. To find the crumbs. And that's what we need to do today. If you say, you know what, I'm really not doing anything big. Well, that's okay, but you need to search your heart for the crumbs, for anything left over. And throw it down at the altar. And say, God, I'm on your side. Amen? Amen. Amen. Stand with me. I know everybody in here, I know everybody in here is saved. So what we're going to do is I want everybody to come forward. Time to get real with God.